Yes. Uh, we are with Sergio Ribeiro today. Sergio, welcome to the Relatively Speaking. Hello, good evening. Yeah, thank you for coming and we will talk no, today. We will talk today about China and Sergio Ribeiro, or Sergio, I will call you Sergio, because you are oh, my it's friend. Fine. Yeah, Sergio is PhD exactly. candidate. Exactly. Uh, yeah, Sergio is a PhD candidate in University of Minio, and but his expertise comprises the China and China-related issues, but specifically he's interested in the Chinese language and culture. That's correct. He, he stayed in China four years, and he worked as well. And today, Sergio, we're going to cover a lot of topics with you. And yes, we will. And I will start with protests in Hong Kong. And okay, first of all, I'm really happy to, to be talking to you. And you. this is a very interesting project. Yeah. Uh, and as you said, we have a lot of issues to cover. And uh, I really hope we have time because there's a lot of really interesting things going on in China right now. And you just mentioned the main one, I think, the Hong Kong protests. Because when people thought the protests were calming down, suddenly the situation became, became much more dire and, um, and out of control. And a situation that is not something that is easily, easily managed. Because the problem here is, uh, is a, diff a, a huge difference between systems, between ages, between uh, um, the mainland and, what it, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference between the, both political situations and the different cultures. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at Hong Kong, the, they've always had some Chinese, and by Chinese I mean uh, related to the Communist Party, some Chinese institutions in the city. But as far as the education is concerned, it has always been relatively independent. So, it, uh, when the Chinese Communist Party tried to control the education in Hong Kong, what would happen was that the syndicates, the teachers, the parents, the students, they would fight against it. So you have a whole generation of students that has been studying Western values in Hong Kong schools and universities. And those were the students that were out uh, back in 2014 in the Umbrella Movement protests. Mm -hmm. And these ones are much more dangerous, of course, because they they basically include every age, every sector of, of Hong Kong society. So it's a really difficult situation, I think, for the Communist Party to solve right now. But a, it was 2014, right? The umbrella movement started. Yes. It yeah. was the first time that we are witnessing a protests in Hong Kong, actually, right? In Hong Kong, exactly. Yes. I mean, uh, under Chinese rule, at least. Mm -hmm. I believe you had some protests before, but nothing, nothing like this. But in 2014, it was basically students doing the protests, and they were relatively peaceful. This was something that the students learned with time, because, of course, I'm not advocating for violence, but what they realized was that when the protests were too peaceful, what would happen is that people would give up. They wouldn't create the kind of chaos that they wanted to create. And these protests, this time, they were still peaceful, but as the, pro the violence escalated, so did the police violence as well. Mm -hmm. So you are in a situation in which it was the reply, the answer by the government to the protests that created even more protests. Otherwise, they would probably have died down with the end of the, the extradition law. Mm -hmm. Because the extradition law is formally, uh, formally done. But the protests are still continuing because of the police violence, because of a lot of different issues that have always existed, such as universal suffrage, mm -hmm. such as, uh, I wouldn't say independence, but uh, real autonomy from China. Mm -hmm. and, uh, was, it, was it a viable or applic applicable solution, a one state and two, two systems? I mean, I think it was the only possible solution. There was no other pollution, uh, solution at the time. We're talking about the 90s, so Hong Kong would be 97. And in, uh, back in 97, um, China was basically uh, approaching the, 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 the end of the, the, the century. Mm -hmm. 
the millennium actually and they really wanted to, to do this unification project in a in a way that wouldn't hurt the, the 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 country's prestige and reputation at the same time because they wouldn't want to sound threatening and at the same time the only way for the uk to be able to leave this with a relatively honorable solution was to provide the British subjects, so the, the Queen subjects living in Hong Kong, with some degree of freedom of speech so that they wouldn't be immediately absorbed into a, I mean, what is still considered an autocratic government. So this was the only possible solution for Hong Kong and Macau later. Mm -hmm. So the one country, two systems. And it has worked for a while. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the big problem was that so it will end officially in 2047, the Hong Kong uh, uh, system, whereas the Macau one will last for two more years. They cannot wait until 2047 to change society, to suddenly turn a democracy into an autocratic regime. Mm -hmm. They can't wait that long. They have to slowly, slowly start encroaching on democratic values, changing the mentality of the people in the island, in, mm -hmm. the, in the city, I mean. And... Um, Education is a way, but it hasn't worked, as we can see. So the other money is another way, so the financial benefit of joining China. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't really worked as well, mm -hmm. uh, from what we can see, because the situation in Hong Kong, financially speaking, isn't really that... I mean, isn't it what it used to be? For example, in terms of housing prices, they are, mere, they are completely chaotic right now in Hong Kong. Yes. So it was a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. And the extradition law, and uh, uh, I'm sure uh, I'm not sure if our viewers know what the extra, what exactly the extradition yeah, law is. Explain if you want. But uh, basically, Hong Kong is still it's not a country, but we can call it a society where you have rule uh, of law. Okay, the rule of law. This is very important. We have it in the West, generally speaking, and the rule of law is something that guarantees that. Any citizen of Hong Kong, if he's a law-abiding citizen, if he has, uh, if his rights are being infringed by the government, the law will be on his side. And China is not a rule of law country. China is a rule by law mm. country. Yes. So it's a different dynamic. And the extradition law would would formalize an agreement in which um, people would infringe the law in Hong Kong would be able to be sent to the mainland, to China, to proper China proper, where they, where they would get a trial. And this in Chinese is called, um, the, it was actually the term used in Hong Kong, is Song Zhong. Song, which means to send. Mm. Zhong is the um, abbreviation for China. So send to China, Song Zhong. The interesting thing about this is that if you pronounce it in a different way, so Song Zhong, mm -hmm. it means, to pay your respect to someone that is about to die. Wow. So that's the idea that exists in Hong Kong. When you're sending someone to China, people will die. They will not come back. Yeah. And at the same time, if you look at the, the level of prosecution in China, so if someone is going to be prosecuted by the state, that person needs to know that there's a 99% chance, and I mean statistic. High, slightly higher than 99%, actually, statistically speaking, that the person is going to be considered guilty. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the Chinese prosecutors are really good. It just means that the law there is done in a, such a vague way that basically you're living in a, in a democracy in Hong Kong, but at the same time, if you commit any kind of crime in a really vague way, you, can, you could basically be sent to China and then you wouldn't come back. So okay. people rioted against that, journalists, lawyers, uh, a lot of businessmen. Oh, yes, a lot of businessmen there. Mm -hmm. and so people from all walks of society. And it's, now it's not just about that, I think. Can we say that? Um, because um, even though you, you said democracy, okay, we have different system, and you can find a piece of democracies, in, I mean, at least... At least the system is kind of like a democracy. Yeah, Hong exactly. Kong. Not exactly a democracy. The thing, I th the thing, I think, the the at the end of the day, China. I mean, CCP is determining the chief of execu executives in Hong Kong. 
Yes. That is the point, actually. I that is the point. It, it, actually, it started with, um, with extradition law, but now it has moved into something else. Carrie Lam, Carrie Lam, so the governor of Hong Kong, she's the, the, the centerpiece in what is going on here. Because as you said, and you said it rightly so, that in Hong Kong, people don't really get to elect their governor. It's elected amongst, it's basically a very small circle of people, and it's elected, of course, from a group of people that have basically the, the, the permission of the Chinese Communist Party to be there. Of course, Carrie Lam was put there. I, we cannot say that she was put there by the Chinese Communist Party, but if the CCP didn't want her to be there, she wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. Because she's not going, she's not, she doesn't have complete authority over what is going on in the island. Yeah. That's, uh, that's for, for sure, that's certain. Um, she's almost governing as some sort of viceroy, if we could call it, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, as a link to the past, because she actually has to obey what is going on in Beijing. Mm -hmm. You have two laws, you have the Hong Kong law, but you also have the Chinese constitution. Mm -hmm. It must be followed up to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So she... For example, there was some some rumors as well, and she gave. There was a dinner in which you had one of those hot mic situations. She was basically speaking, and someone was recording her voice, and she was basically saying that it is quite difficult for her. The situation right now is quite difficult for her because she cannot do what she really wants to do. She has to compromise between the Hong Kong situation and the CCP situation. Mm -hmm. And right now, and it's one of the topics that we're probably going to discuss today, um, the, the kind of... Right now, China is ruled by Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is not... The president Xi Jinping is not similar to the rulers that you had in the past. Okay. He's, a much more, he's a much stronger ruler, especially if you compare him to Hu Jintao. If this was happening under last, the, the, previous, the former president, Hu Jintao, the situation probably wouldn't have been the same. Uh, there, wouldn't have, there wouldn't have even been an extradition law, maybe. Mm -hmm. Because China changed so much since 2012. Um, with the, the, the coming of the new president, at first it was a bit slow, but with time things became much more controlled, surveillance increased, propaganda increased, mm -hmm. you know, almost... I mean, it increased exponentially. I've, when I was working in, in China, I'm not going to say which universities I was working in, but I would see students having, uh, students have classes on Marxism in Chinese universities. These are compulsory, mm -hmm. studying Marxism. Mm -hmm. They have exams about Marxism at university level, regardless of what they're studying there, regard, regardless of what their major is, I mean. Um, there was a situation in which I had students that I had to do an oral presentation in my class, and I was teaching at that time history of Portugal, and they had to do an oral presentation during the break so that they could show their, the, the, the local secretary for the Communist Party, so the, the group that was uh, watching over the university mm -hmm. sent by the Communist Party. And the presentation was basically about the the great victories of the Chinese revolution and uh, so this kind of propaganda mm -hmm. kind of topics mm -hmm. and they were forced to do it and it even got worse after I left mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there isn't any kind of freedom of speech and people in Hong Kong they can see exactly what is going on mm -hmm. so it's I don't know how they're going to, to, to solve this because even if the protests stop as I said, you have a generation that completely hates China. If you look at the numbers, sorry, you, you want to say something? Yeah, sorry. I just, I'm, I'm really curious about your opinion, actually, because um, the other parts of the world are not immune from the wave of mm -hmm. protests. Look at, when, when we look at the Bolivia recently, mm -hmm. what happened to Evo Morales and Lebanon, and exactly Lebanon, Chile, it's still ongoing. Do you think it's uh, we we are witnessing a global wave of protests? I mean, it could be, it could be because this was the first one. Mm -hmm. If you look or, at, or, uh, yeah, please, please go. Go, go on, finish the question. I'm so sorry. Or, or we, we are witnessing, or we are 
we should actually uh, investigate uh, investigate the situation case by case because they have different fundamentals, they have different causes. Even though we see uh, moments, peaceful demonstrations, sometimes mm -hmm. that's a, a quite a difficult question, and it would provide for really good research. Yeah. So, are these protests all connected, or should they be should they be studied case by case? Mm -hmm. In the case of Hong Kong. You do have the Gilets Jaunes in Paris, so the Yellow Jacket protests in, in Paris. That wasn't that long ago, actually. Yeah. But I do, I do think it was, it's a completely different situation because in Paris, you have people protesting against a democratically elected government yeah. not that long ago, yeah. with, of course, reasons to protest. I'm not saying that they didn't have their own their reasons. But in Hong Kong, they see it as a, almost as a fight for survival because yeah. it's... You see a lot of people in the streets saying that this is their last chance. Because if they didn't protest right now, after the extradition law had passed, it would have been legal for them to be sent to China if they committed any kind of uh, crime, let's say. Mm -hmm. So um, I think they should be seen case by case, at least the Hong Kong one. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bolivia, you had protests in Brazil during the Dilma impeachment process and after that, so there, there is a, there was a rise in in, uh, in protests and uh, almost at the same time as we had a lowering in the quality of democracies all over the world. Mm -hmm. But in Hong Kong, I do not think these are related. But I might be wrong, of okay. course. I might well, be completely well, well, wrong about what this. What would be the solution then? I mean, do you think will TCP will intervene the protests via PLA? Mm -hmm. I mean, are we going to see? Second Tiananmen Square. Event. Okay. Yeah. Um, my heart says no because that would be incredibly dangerous. Uh, another Tiananmen Square situation. But and um, my mind right now is telling me that's almost impossible for the CCP to intervene in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. Of course, they are being pressured to intervene internally. Pressured to intervene. But at the same time, it's a pressure that they can deal with. The problem of inter, the problem of the Tiananmen Square massacre. I mean, the problem for the CCP. Mm -hmm. It was one of many uh, protests going on in the same year. It wasn't the only one, mm -hmm. but there was a coincidence happening at the time. It was uh, Gorbachev was visiting China at the time, mm -hmm. so you had a lot of foreign media in Beijing. So when it happens, the foreign media was there to cover it. So they have all of those amazing pictures and, and uh, I mean, the man standing in front of the tank column. That wouldn't have been possible without free media. Mm -hmm. And they are all in Hong Kong right now. So if something dangerous like this happens in Hong Kong, the media would be there to cover it. And you can accuse the Chinese Communist Party of being, of being good and evil. That's a matter of opinion. But you cannot accuse them of being... Uh, of ignoring this fact. They know exactly that intervening in Hong Kong would be a huge mistake in terms of, in terms of uh, um, basically the, the image of China all over the world, because it would show that they hadn't learned anything since 1989. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, there was actually one of those moments where uh, Carrie Lam was speaking to a, uh, it was a private dinner, the hot mic situation I mentioned before. Yes. And uh, she said, the PLA has no intention of invading Hong Kong, of intervening in Hong Kong. Okay. No intention. She oh. assured that, like the, the, I'm not sure who was a baby businessman, but she assured them that there is no intention. It's basically a show of force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if they intervene, some of the protesters are arguing that the protest wins because that's what they really want, at least some of them. An intervention would focus the international attention on Hong Kong again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not really sure they were going to take the bait, the CCP. Mm -hmm. Okay. And other a topic that I tried to gather was about the trade dispute with USA. Actually, we, 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 we have seen a economic warfare between US and China in terms exactly. of tariffs or Huawei's bans and 
um, as far as I remember, Huawei is a CEO daughter arrested in Canada. Yes, the daughter we arrested have, in yeah, Canada. We different, exactly. We have different parties, and uh, what will be happen? I mean, in terms of U.S. and China relations, are we going to see new Cold War? I mean in terms of trade or? I think we are already going through some sort of cold war. Of course, we cannot talk about a bilateral world anymore, but at the same time, this is the only, I find that this is the only bipartisan issue in the United States at this time. Because people look at the trade war as something being led and being pushed by Donald Trump. Of course, Trump is a major factor with the kind of in predictability that he can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, this is a bipartisan issue. I remember when Trump was starting to criticize China, perhaps even starting the, the, the trade war, you had a post, a Twitter post by Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer mm -hmm. congratulating him. And it was almost historical for Chuck Schumer to congratulate Donald Trump on anything. Mm -hmm. And he was congratulating Trump for basically facing China and asking him to go further. Mm -hmm. So this is a bipartisan issue. And um, I don't imagine that this, this trade war is going to, to, is going to be solved anytime soon, because there is a lot of, um, how can I say, this is hurting China. This is really hurting China. Mm -hmm. Of course, you don't see a lot of news. And if you look at Beijing, the situation is more or less stable. But I've seen reports about pri food prices in the interior of China ri rising exponentially. Mm -hmm. And is it related to the trade war? Is it related to the slowing down of the Chinese economic growth? Because it has been slowing down as of late. Of course, it's still at really high levels compared to European levels, of course, but it's already slowing down. Mm -hmm. And they, had a lot of, they have a lot of other problems, structural problems in their economy that are basically basically coming to the surface right now. Mm -hmm. And of, let's not even mention in the huge environmental damage that has been done, especially in the north part of China, because of the economic growth. But I don't imagine that this trade war is going to end any time soon. And the trade war, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the Huawei, everything is related. Okay. And I, I've, see, I've seen Chinese uh, prestige, not prestige, but the... the Soft power, for example, Chinese soft power has been on the decline as of late. Mm -hmm. First with the trade war and now with the, um, with the Hong Kong protests. Mm -hmm. So I think this is part of a, of a, a conjoined effort. Mm -hmm. And we have also um, European Union position and it's really strategically important, I mean, in terms of trade war. But they are they are positioning themselves as unwilling to you know act because uh, they have good relations. Some countries have good relations with China, but they they still have to do something with uh, tariffs. And I, I was going to ask you about the European Union role in terms of this dispute. I mean, or we can talk about. China-European relations, European Union relations, especially Portugal has mm -hmm. interests still here. I mean, over there, mm -hmm. Macau and other countries also. What do you the want? situation about the European Union is that China played their cards in a really strategically smart way. When we had a huge crisis in Europe, uh, so back in 28, 29, 2010, 2011, when you had Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, in huge financial situations, mm -hmm. uh, in huge financial, in a huge financial crisis, you had China basically offering a hand of friendship to Greece, to Portugal as well, and, for example, the Chinese, the Portuguese electricity company. So the electricity that I am using now, for instance, mm -hmm. part of it is owned by China, by the Three Gorges Dam. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of investment in these countries. And the thing about the European Union is that we are not a cohesive block yet. Mm -hmm. So you have some countries, especially if you go to Eastern, uh, to Eastern Europe, and if you leave the EU, it's even, the difference is even starker. If you go to Serbia, for example, China has huge interests in Serbia, in Albania as well. But if you look at Western Europe, France, I, I, in my perspective, France, 
Germany, these two countries are not currently aligned with neither China nor the US, mm -hmm. uh, yes, but they are not defending China as they did, for example, with Iran, mm -hmm. when you had, yeah, when you had uh, basically Trump uh, starting sanctions again with Iran. You had some pushback from the European Union. I'm not seeing that pushback right now. I'm seeing the US, I'm seeing Canada as well, mm -hmm. which is a country that you have Justin Trudeau that is not aligned in any way with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So I say that this is not uh, something done only by Donald Trump. You still have the West. Uh, I'm going to give you a good example, I think. You have the One Belt, One Road, a major, major strategic like, infrastructure development plan by China. Mm -hmm. And Portugal was basically invited to join the One Belt, One Road. President Xi Jinping visited Portugal in 2018, so basically last year. Mm -hmm. there, was, there were negotiations and we signed a memorandum, not saying that Portugal would join, we didn't join, but saying that we will support the One Belt, One Road mm -hmm. as friends. Yes. When people were talking about Portugal joining and about 5G internet, Chinese 5G internet in Portugal, there were warnings by President Macron of France, mm. saying that France would be very disappointed if Portugal joined the One Belt, One Road, for example. So we have pressure on both sides, but I don't see China uh, having a friend in the European Union right now, okay. because it's difficult to, to defend China with everything that is going on. Was it specific to Macron's ideology or standing, or just you think it was the state policy to? I, I don't think it was just Macron because Merkel isn't really isn't really on very friendly terms with China right now. Of course, you still have a lot of trade going on because we we need to trade with China, mm -hmm. but things are not the way they were five years ago. Definitely. And uh, I don't see the European Union supporting China in mm -hmm. this. I see the European Union keeping some sort of neutrality. Yes. And uh, it was also negotiation by the, by the American president, because if you look at the so-called trade war between the US and uh, Europe, the European Union, yeah. it stopped suddenly. Mm -hmm. And moments after it stopped, the European Union started basically moving slowly towards the United States in this China trade war issue. Mm -hmm. So basically, I, there were some analysts at the time saying that there might have been an agreement between Trump and the EU, uh, because Trump basically wanted allies against China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but I, what, I, what my opinion differs from a lot of people is that I don't see this breaking China. I don't think this trade war is going to affect the stability of the Communist Party, mm -hmm. in the short run, at least. Yeah, because China is powerful enough to sustain itself, to, you know... It... Not, not, not a matter of... Yes, they are powerful enough, but they really depend on trade. That's a fact. If trade goes down, the Chinese economy goes down. That's, that's for sure. But the thing is, China, the way I see it, Chinese stability is based on four factors, four pillars that are, in my opinion, fundamental for the Chinese political culture and mentality. Because if you look at uh, one of the, the, the main, the main uh, factors is, of course, wealth. Because we're talking about a country that not that long ago, had, uh, so in the late 50s and early 60s, had millions of people dying of starvation. Mm -hmm. So wealth, having enough food on the plate, and, this, and in this case, having enough cell phones. So basically, being able to have this kind of capitalist economy in China is fundamental. Yes, but that's not the only factor. You have safety as well. The Chinese Communist Party guarantees the safety of the country. And by safety, I mean having a society in which you basically can walk through the streets at night and nothing will happen to you in which if there is a crime being committed, the, pe the perpetrator will probably get caught. This is fundamental for Chinese. They call it Anchuan. Anchuan means actually safety. Mm -hmm. And it's something that they emphasize on their daily life. Mm -hmm. How is this related to the other issue? It's the other factors. Stability. Stability is fundamental in China. So anything that, uh, for example, let's imagine that uh, the, the economic situation um, 
basically uh, keeps slowing down and you have a rising unemployment rate, people still value stability. They don't want people on the streets rioting against the Chinese Communist Party. They don't want a repeat of what happened in the 60s and the, and the early 70s with uh, the country coming to a halt, the breakdown of society, I mean, the Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. breaking down of society. So they value this. They prefer to slowly change the government than to even talk about, about crashing it down. Mm -hmm. So these kind of issues, and then the other one, the last factor, so wealth, safety, stability, and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And this is a matter of sovereignty mm -hmm. because this is a trade war. This is not something that internally, in terms of China, can, they are attributing to the Chinese Communist Party's mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's being attributed to the West, to the United States, to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. We are the ones that are hurting their economy. So they are able to unite their people around this. So the uh, Hong Kong situation is really interesting in a way. I'm not sure if people that are watching are aware, but in Hong Kong, at first the Chinese media, of course it's completely state-controlled media, the Chinese media was ignoring the situation in Hong Kong. They mentioned a protest there, but it was a pro-China protest with um, maybe 200,000 people, of course exaggerated numbers, pro-China protest. But when the situation escalated, when you got violence against policemen, then they started broadcasting those images. Of course, edited images, cut images, just showing rioters beating up policemen. And this is basically a warning saying, if society breaks down, if the people protest on the streets, this is what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Strikes, subways being occupied, airports being occupied, our police that we respect so much being beaten, down, being beaten down savagely by uh, mobs in the streets. So they have their own mechanisms of keeping their internal stability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm not even imagining that changing in the future, mm -hmm. at least not yet. Okay. As for the China, we have a, another problematic issue you mentioned mm -hmm. about Taiwan. But uh, if you don't mind, uh, can you give us, give us a... Uh, um, idea what's going on with Taiwan and China or can you give us a historical perspective what is the what is the issue with I mean Shanghai Sheikh we know in the nationalist and communist mm -hmm. party we have Mao Zedong and there was a civil war in China yes. can you just give a historical perspective okay in, a, in really brief terms uh, after World War Two, you had a very brief civil war from 45 to 49, okay. which the Chinese call the Liberation War. Mm -hmm. So the people in China, basically, they, the Communist Party was much more popular at the time. So the peasants and um, most of the lower classes, they joined the Communist Party numbers and the elite, along with some of the generals, including Chiang Kai-shek, yeah. fled to Taiwan. The Chinese Communist Party did not have a fleet at the time capable of invading Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So you had a status quo being enforced during the Cold War by the United States as well. Mm -hmm. China tried to invade Taiwan a couple of times, but uh, they failed. One of the times they failed miserably because it's really difficult to invade Taiwan. So during the Cold War, these countries developed themselves in a really different way. China was, uh, was basically a communist part, uh, country until the, the open door policy, until everything changed mm -hmm. uh, by the end of the century. And uh, Taiwan was basically a military dictatorship mm -hmm. with uh, martial law, the longest lasting martial law in world history was in Taiwan mm -hmm. until Chiang Kai-shek died. Chiang ching wo was his son, uh, uh, eventually succeeded him and he democratized the island. So Taiwan, in my opinion, is the, is the, the I cannot say the best, the most developed democracy in Asia right now, in uh, Southeast Asia at least, maybe better than Jap even Japan or, or South Korea. Because Which you have governing now liberal democrats. The, yes, yes, yes. Okay. You have two parties in uh, in uh, in Taiwan at the time. You uh, right now, 
Uh, actually, this is a very interesting moment because you're going to have an election coming soon in January. Mm -hmm. And you have the Kuomintang. The Kuomintang are the Nationalist Party. Mm -hmm. So let's call them the Blue Party because these are actually the terms they use, the Blue Party. Mm -hmm. And uh, led by, right now, led by a man called Han Kuo Yu. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about the Nationalists is that they have always claimed that Taiwan is China. There was a document signed in 1992, and this is very important, saying that both the Taiwanese and the Chinese government acknowledge that there is only one China. Okay. So Taiwan is the Republic of China. Beijing, so the rest the continent, the continent, is the People's Republic of China. This is important because by acknowledging that Taiwan is China, they're basically pushing back any independent uh, independence claims because they cannot say, no, from now on we are an independent country. What do you mean? You are China. So you cannot be an independent country. But the other party, so the liberals, the, uh, the other, let's call them some sort of progressive party, the Green Party led by Tsai Ing-wen. Mm -hmm. uh, at this time, Tsai Ing-wen hasn't yet acknowledged the 1992 declaration. So Can this party... Give us a little bit of what was the 1992 the, What I mean is the declaration that it is only one China. Ah, okay, one China. Okay. The current president of Taiwan hasn't acknowledged that. Mm -hmm. Because it's customary for a president in Taiwan to be elected and eventually the first year acknowledge that okay. that declaration. We will follow the declaration. She hasn't done that. Mm -hmm. Because th that her party is pro-Taiwan. It's not pro-China. Mm -hmm. So it's a party that wants to change the status quo slowly because they cannot do it unilaterally, of course. But change it so that people don't really refer to Taiwan as the Republic of China but rather as Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So maybe the Republic of Taiwan, something like that. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at younger people, they don't see themselves as China. Mm -hmm. It's, and the situation in, in Taiwan, economically speaking, there was some kind of issues by the, by the current president Tsai Ing-wen uh, related to some labor laws that were passed that were really unpopular and she was going down in popularity and at the same time at the same time and it has been proven china kept helping the other candidates the nationalist party candidate han kuo yu he rose quickly through the polls there was a a media campaign a viral media campaign about him in taiwan in which later people discovered that the founders the leaders of the group were living in china were probably attributed to Chinese government uh, forces um, and uh, I wouldn't say hackers, but basically these kind of groups that operate in social media, mm -hmm. the cell, similar Troll to what patterns, you have. Trolls, trolls, you mean? Trolls? Trolls, yes, yeah. something like trolls, but really helping and, for, and creating this kind of fake viral campaign mm -hmm. about Han Kuo Yu. And Han Kuo Yu was rising in the polls slowly, saying what kept going down, and then Hong, the Hong Kong situation happened, and this happened. Tsai Ing-wen is much more popular mm -hmm. right now than, she, than what she was before, because she is anti-China. Mm -hmm. Whereas Han Kuo Yu has already claimed that if he wins, he predicts a lot of good business opportunities with the mainland. Mm -hmm. But the general uh, grand strategy of Taiwan is to keep in the status quo, right? China. They have to keep the status quo because the, what is helping us, the, the Taiwanese situation is that Taiwan hasn't yet declared independence. They're not going to, they can't. Because when they declare independence, this is a, okay, and then we're talking about sovereignty, one of the pillars again. If they declare independence, the people of China will force the government to do something about it mm -hmm. because it's, they are infringing on the sovereignty of China. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if they keep the situation, if they keep the status quo, Taiwan right now, and this is the other issue, Taiwan is basically independent. It is basically a state, a country, what you, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. because it has its own flag, its own anthem, its own government. It doesn't swear allegiance to any other foreign government. It's not acknowledged by a lot of nations, but they still 
do they still have really strong diplomatic i mean not diplomatic but commercial uh, relations with taiwan mm -hmm. and, and taiwan is, speaking they have a really powerful military as we talk they have a powerful military uh, not powerful as you know they can defeat china no not that powerful but taiwan can keep the status quo uh, in case of china, of a chinese invasion for enough time to the United States to intervene eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about Taiwan, it's actually, I read a report about this, it's really difficult to invade Taiwan. Because Taiwan, even though they are an island, first of all, you have typhoons in the region. Mm -hmm. To do a large scale invasion, you need a, a huge fleet. And there are only a couple of months in the year in which you can actually plan for a decent invasion. Because otherwise, you're going to have currents, you're going to have typhoons, you're going to have a lot of difficult, a lot of weather difficulties. Mm -hmm. The second factor is that you only have basically two or three areas in Taiwan where you can actually stage a landing, mm -hmm. because the the coast isn't. Um, it's not basically a beach. It's high rocks, so you cannot stage an invasion like that. Mm -hmm. You have to pick the right place, and it's easier for the defender to hold, mm -hmm. because when you're landing, you lose your numerical advantage. So the army in Taiwan, and that's how they were able to defend the, the, the Chinese in the first invasion, because they weren't ready. And of course, in the long protracted war, China would easily defeat Taiwan, but you, we have to remember that you have the United States as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Taiwan is a flourishing democracy, so it would be... And China will not invade Taiwan, I don't imagine. Mm -hmm. It's... We can say at the end of today, we, we, we're going to see the status quo, I mean, in the future. Yeah, they will keep, nothing they will try to force the status yeah. quo. Yeah. Okay. While, yeah. while isolating them diplomatically, uh -huh. and as they have been doing in the past, so forcing the, the few countries in the world that still have a relationship with Taiwan, that still have uh, diplomatic relations with Taiwan, to renounce those relations and switch over to China, mm -hmm. basically through bribery. Mm -hmm. That's how they do it. For example, in Guinea-Bissau, so a former Portuguese colony, so a Lusophone country, so a Portuguese-speaking country in Africa, had, um, I think it was Guinea-Bissau, I think it was Guinea-Bissau, but was one of the few countries that still didn't have um, a diplomatic relation, relationship with China. Mm -hmm. with the People's Republic of China. And when they switched, there was huge investment in the country by the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, op, uh, opportunities for students from that country to, 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 to study abroad in China. So they have this kind of this package of advantages mm -hmm. and uh, they have been doing that successfully. Mm -hmm. okay. And another point that I want to talk with you is the propaganda, and you mentioned before, actually, and propaganda and surveillance. I think it's the buzzword recently to talk about a social credit system in China, which is basically a, related to artificial intelligence and the algorithms that uh, that identify identify your face and through the WeChat program you can do whatever you want but at the same time even though they are looking like a beneficial for society to conduct their daily lives and but at the same time you have huge machine i mean like big brother is watching you exactly exactly and, big brother and, is watching yeah and you have and, uh, and you have um, what was the big firewall chinese firewall the great firewall great, of china great, great the great firewall, firewall. yeah can that's just, not an official name but uh, it's commonly used yeah. can, you, can you just give us an idea what is the propaganda, how it works in China, how it manipulates or uh, how can I say control the society and how surveillance okay. is effective in China? Okay, well, first of all, really quickly, I want to do a retraction because I said it was Guinea-Bissau and it's Santo and Principe. So it's another Portuguese speaking oh. country and I am sorry for that no. in 2016. Yeah. Uh, about the propaganda machine, it's, it's huge. And it's not just the fact that there is uh, this level of control, is that people know 
that the Chinese Communist Party is everywhere. So we have a really high degree of self-censorship happening in China, not just with Chinese citizens, with foreigners as well that live there. And uh, yes, you have face recognition. You have um, basically cameras everywhere in the streets. So if someone commits a crime, escaping would be really difficult because as soon as you get into a car, you're going to be seen by a traffic light, by a camera in a traffic light. Mm -hmm. So it's the level of the amount of technology, technological developments that have been successfully applied by the party to serve, uh, for surveilling their own society is, is appalling. Uh, and, but at the same time, it gives them a sense of security. Because I've seen people in China saying that cliche sentence, well, if we don't have anything to hide, you don't have anything to fear. Mm -hmm. And you have this kind of mentality that still exists in China nowadays. And uh, it's not just what the Chinese Communist Party can do, because it also throws a very long, a very big shade. And people are uh, really scared of that shade. Uh, you know, what, and what I mean by this is that the Chinese Communist Party has reached a, a certain threshold, a certain level, in which it can intimidate the society without even doing anything. People are, if people are typing something on, no, because people use WeChat. WeChat, Weixin, is a similar a program that is very similar to WhatsApp that we use in the, in the West. And of course, everything is controlled. The language that you can use is controlled. And I've seen people that do not even want to use the word Taiwan in a discussion, even if they are talking um, about the geography of the island. They refuse to use the word Taiwan because they are afraid that it triggers something in, the, in some kind of, uh, of algorithm. Mm -hmm. Some and kind of said also, sorry, uh, Tibet, right? Tibet also. Tibet. Let's not even talk about Tibet. Yeah. That's even an even worse issue. Yeah. Because Taiwan, the, I mean, a Chinese citizen would say Taiwan. That's it. In Tibet, they say Shizang. Shizang is the word for the Chinese word for Tibet. So if you're saying Shizang, oh, sorry, Shizang in a conversation, fine, Shizang, Tibet. But if I use the word Tibet, then I am officially a foreigner talking about Tibet. And this raises a, it raises the alarm. Of course, it's not if you write the word Tibet in the, in the I mean, and you send a message with that word, nothing is going to happen. But people are afraid. People will not do it because, as I said, it's a rule of law, not rule by law. So, uh, uh, I mean, it's a rule by law, not rule of law. So the Chinese Communist Party will use the laws, and they are incredibly vague to. Um, to basically have complete control over society. And every dissenting voice is silenced, not just by the party, by, but by their peers, because you have nationalism, you have propaganda seeping into the minds of the people in China. If you go into a Chinese, if you turn on your television in China at about 7 p.m., half past 6, 7 p.m., it's still quite common to see Chinese shows in which the Japanese are depicted as the villains. Sometimes in really shameful ways. One thing is talking about a show set in World War II, so the, the second Sino-Japanese War, in which the Japanese, of course, it, were, in, historically speaking, in Chinese history, the villains. Mm -hmm. But you have shows, even nowadays, in which the Japanese character is always portrayed as the um, perverted old man that uh, basically will grope a waitress in the restaurant because he's Japanese and he thinks he can do whatever he wants. You have propaganda everywhere, in every stage of society. Does it really work or people, is, people are pretending to be, you know, they're brainwashed or, you know, or manipulated? It depends on the person you're talking about because if people have an education, China is a, kind, is, is a meritocracy. So people that have, that have skills, people that are intelligent, people that have gone to good universities, they don't get this kind of propaganda because the propaganda is going to be lower for them. I've heard about people in, uh, in Tsinghua University, so the best university in China, mm -hmm. openly discussing what is going on in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. openly with all of the data because the party trusts these people with all of the information. 
But if you go to the, if you go to a bar, if you go to a village, if you talk to these kind of people, so the everyday Joe in China, mm-hmm. propaganda works mm-hmm. really, really well. Mm-hmm. And you just need to sit down and talk to a taxi driver. Mm-hmm. You're going to notice that they know China is not perfect. They know this. And the government keeps saying, I mean, openly, we do not have a perfect country. We are a country that isn't developed yet mm-hmm. in development. Mm-hmm. So this is important for China because if they suddenly become a developed country, they cannot use the, the, the excuse that China is still slowly rising. Mm-hmm. So people are very forgiving about certain issues in China, but as soon as sovereignty is affected, we have to understand that China was humiliated by the West for 100 years. Uh, they call it the 100 years of humiliation. Ever since the Opium War with the UK, so early 19th century, or mid 19th century, more or less, until Second World War. That was when the humiliation finally stopped in the eyes of the Chinese people. So anything that they can use against the West, as in this is Western interference, the West is funding the rioters in Hong Kong. The, the economic situation isn't good right now because of the West, because of Donald Trump. This really works. I, I do think it's effective. Uh, do you think it's uh, also related to, I mean, propaganda and surveillance is directly related to the regime stability? I mean, CCP's regime stability and PLA's uh, strategic thinking about the future. I mean, as you said, they are, they are afraid of the influence of West, actually. I'm, exactly. I'm sure of, what do you think about that? It's, it's interesting because in, it has to do again with the Chinese political culture right now. And if you look at uh, Chinese culture, this is an area that I actually want to explore in the future. There was this kind of, basically, a, the Chinese Communist Party could argue that there was a complete, complete and total breakdown in what was the former Chinese culture and the new China. So the socialist Marxist, Leninist, Maoist uh, China. But at the same time, there was a continuity. And there is a notion in China called He Xie. He Xie comes from Confucianism. It means harmony. Mm. And harmony in society is really important for China. So if you, of course, this is not valid for every Chinese citizen, but generally speaking, Chinese citizens are, Chinese people are people that would prefer to avoid conflict to solve everything through negotiation, through, um, if, you're going, if you invite someone that is Chinese to go, I mean, to have dinner with you, they will not say no, they will give you a reason. Even though you know that the reason is not valid, you're, they're basically trying to, to keep the harmony between the, your relationship and the relation uh, between you and them and him. Mm-hmm. So if they give you the straight no, the direct no, it's going to, to, to be damaging in their view. This makes it really easy for a country, for, for a government to rule society because you have this situation in the harmony mm-hmm. and people are not going to riot normally, generally speaking, mm-hmm. because the government actually control, of course, you have this whole propaganda um, and uh, if you are, imagine that you are criticizing the government in social media. That's fine. You can do that in China. You can criticize the government. You can say that X, X and Y probably has a, probably has a lover, a mistress somewhere. You can say that they don't care about the people, but the moment you're trying to make it sound that you want to do something about it, mm-hmm. that you want the people to go to the streets, that's, that's the moment your post goes down. Mm-hmm. That's the moment you lose your internet connection. Mm-hmm. And if you keep doing that, that's the moment someone will visit you and ask what's going on. And at the same time, if you're basically praising someone, if you're praising the, if you're praising the Chinese president, President Xi Jinping, mm-hmm. and you're saying we should all go to the streets and mobilize and, and praise him, praise him openly in the streets, your post is going to go down as well because they don't want this kind of social movement. There was a... Um, 
It was actually a research by Professor King from uh, Harvard University, I think, because he was studying uh, how long it would take for Chinese for the Chinese government to censor posts online on Weibo. Weibo uh, to be probably related to face a mix between mix between Facebook and Twitter in China. Mm -hmm. So how quickly, how long would it take for them to censor something? And if it was something criticizing the economy, criticizing a specific person, they would let it stay there. Mm -hmm. But if it was calling for social movement, it would be immediately shut down. And it's related to a huge population of China. I mean. Naturally, naturally, to the huge population. And there is there are people still nowadays that claim that China cannot be a democracy because if China becomes a democracy, it will break will be broken apart like the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. You have people nowadays still claiming that. I don't know if whether it is true or not, but at the same time, they don't have... Do you know when was the last time there was universal suffrage in China? Like a proper election with the people going to the ballot boxes mm -hmm. and voting? Can you even guess when was the last time in Chinese history? Oh, not really. It has never happened. <laughs> Never, not even once. Yeah. Of course, if you consider Taiwan to be the Republic of China, but I'm talking about the continental China. Yes. It has never happened. Not even when China was the Republic of China did you have universal suffrage. Mm -hmm. You have representatives from the provinces electing the president. Mm -hmm. But average citizen was, it never, was never asked. Mm -hmm. So China, the democracy would be a completely new concept for them. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it would, in the opinion of a lot of people, it would go against the meritocracy in China because Xi Jinping, he rose to, uh, up to the level he is right now as president mm -hmm. because he was a really good governor. Mm -hmm. Because when he was in front, uh, when he was governing provinces in China, I think it was Zhejiang province, I might be wrong, don't quote me on that. I think it was Zhejiang province, mm -hmm. was really effective. What he did a really good job. Different? I mean, I was going to ask you, uh, it's good to, to, mm. you mentioned about it. What makes him different? I mean, when you consider... What makes him different? There's an, an interesting difference. Because if you look at the previous presidents, let's focus... Because you, were, you had uh, Mao Zedong, of course, but um, uh, Deng Xiaoping was never formally the leader of China, but he was a very important figure. You have Jiang Zemin, but let's talk about the recent history. If you look at Hu Jintao, Hu Jintao is a good example because Hu Jintao was a president that was more focused in developing the interior of China, in mending the economic, the, the income, the gap between the coast and the, uh, and the interior, the provinces in the interior. Mm -hmm. He was somewhat effective, but at the same time, he kept a very low profile. And there's a, an interesting, an interesting uh, anecdote here. Because if I ask someone in China, who is the president back then, everybody would say Hu Jintao is the president. Mm -hmm. If I asked who is the prime minister, everybody would say Wen Jiabao is the prime minister. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if you ask who is the president, everybody like universally knows it is Xi Jinping. I tried asking a class of university students who is the Chinese prime minister. Because we're talking about the word prime minister in Portugal and in China. And I just, okay, we have a prime minister. What's the name of your prime minister, for example? So that I knew if they knew what the word meant. A lot of students had no idea the name of the current Chinese prime minister. Mm -hmm. Why? Because before the prime minister was relevant, right now the power has been, I mean, the, all of the political power lies in Xi Jinping, not in Li Keqiang. Li Keqiang is the, the current prime minister. Mm -hmm. So he has basically made it all about himself. This kind of, I remember uh, there was a, a Chinese professor in 2013, so not long after Xi Jinping became the leader of China. He basically claimed that Xi Jinping was some sort of Hua Shen. Hua Shen means a living God. Mm -hmm. So he's seen as, he's so respected, he was so respected because when he became president, the first thing he did was fight, was admit that there was a problem of corruption inside the, inside the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And that this problem needed to be dealt with. This was hugely popular with the population because everybody knows there, is a, there was and there still is a lot of corruption in China. Mm -hmm. And by saying, we are going to fight this, and then he actually 
destroy the career of a very prominent politician at the time mm -hmm. because of corruption. Mm -hmm. So he was hugely popular. Of course, people didn't really understand back then, at least in China, that he was basically purging the party mm -hmm. of any of his political enemies. Mm -hmm. And then he accumulated power. And right now is is the sole leader of China because he, the PLA is completely loyal to him. You have another faction in the party, like the Jiang Zemin faction. Jiang Zemin was a former president of China. The Jiang Zemin faction that isn't, in, as far as we know, because we never know, but it is said that doesn't have a really good relationship with the, 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 the Xi Jinping faction. Mm -hmm. It's called the Princeling faction and the hair faction. Hair as in like the heritage hair. Uh, but uh, these different factions have always clashed. Mm -hmm. So you would have, for example, Hu Jintao was from the, the faction that wants to develop the interior. Xi Jinping was the, from the, was the prince link from the faction that wants trade, that wants to develop the coast, that wants technological development, that wants more capitalism, let's say. Mm -hmm. So there is always some kind of issues inside, but right now his role is universally, I mean, his, his position is quite strong, I would say. At the end of the day, Xi Jinping is a, has a really powerful personality and a personal cult, actually, I mean, figure that everyone loves in China, or at least they say so. But the thing uh, for me is, it is the reality that China, he changed the trajectory of China, actually, in terms of technology, trade, and uh, the economic growth. And, but the thing at this point also, we have to ask, I think, is the, will China rise peacefully? <laughs> the thing because uh, it will it will surpass the United States in 2015 according to estimates mm -hmm. but we don't know it's what will happen we don't know it's impossible to predict from the signs that we have right now I would say the rise will continue to be largely peaceful if we can call what is going on in Hong Kong peaceful that is because China will not go to war against the country unless the four pillars are being threatened, unless sovereignty is being threatened. Because China, as a China is basically a country that says we're not going to surrender even one island, even one rock of the country. Mm -hmm. And for this, China considers the whole territory, the island of Taiwan, of course. And the straight and the, the South China Sea with a lot with a lot of islands, and that area might be considered international waters. But China has a strong claim to them. Strong as in they are nearby. Mm -hmm. They patrol those waters constantly. They build artificial islands, mm -hmm. as I'm sure people that are watching are aware or maybe remember those artificial islands being built by China in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, it. As long as these issues, the, the sovereignty of China isn't questioned, I don't imagine China. Um, I don't imagine China being an aggressive country, economically aggressive, certainly, but militarily aggressive. That's not the Chinese style, at least historically speaking, because China has always been a, a, a country that, I mean, they go to war, yes, against their neighbors, but it's basically wars about about prestige, about legitimacy, about honor, about, for example, you had a situation in, uh, in Vietnam that was one of the, um, maybe the last major war in China, mm -hmm. in which China intervened in Vietnam. That would have been late 60s, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was basically proving their strength, a proof of strength, and they retreated. They have no interest in expanding their territory in any way. They have no interest in going really far away from what is their sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. What they want is one China, so Taiwan. If Taiwan declares independence, the answer is going to be very aggressive. Mm -hmm. You have problems with India as well, in certain mountain passes, in the certain territories in the, I mean, 
in what China considers to be Tibet right now, that have been that have been claimed by India and territories in India that are claimed by Tibet. You have this uh, this conflict zone for a poss possible conflict, but it's so difficult to fight there mm -hmm. that uh, I don't imagine any kind of the problem is what the United States wants to do. If the United States wants to really defend Taiwan, if they want to, because you have the Seventh Fleet in the in the in the Pacific, basically, and that fleet enough is capable of basically beating the Chinese fleet. It's the American fleet, hmm. so they take the protection of South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan really seriously. Let's not forget the international waters, the strait near Singapore. All of these areas are having huge economic value for the United States. Mm -hmm. So China will continue, I think, to portray itself as a country that is largely different than the United States. Because the United States, the United States wants to politically impose, I mean, in accordance to Chinese views, mm -hmm. wants to politically impose their system. They use the expression, the expression, Shijie Jing Cha means the world police. That's what they consider the United States to be. And China wants to play differently. They want to keep harmony, even in international relations. What does it mean, harmony in international relations? In harmony, they have a saying in Chinese that translated would be, some, would be something like different but harmonious. So our countries, political, our countries' political systems are different from each other, but that's not a problem in our relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what China defends, and as long as people don't mess with these pillars, as long as people don't um, interfere with matters of Chinese sovereignty, mm -hmm. the relationship is going to be quite good, like the one we have between Portugal and China. Mm -hmm. Because Portugal, historically speaking, has always respected Chinese sovereignty, even with Macau. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot know exactly for sure what happened then, but the official story was that Macau was given to Portugal by China mm -hmm. um, centuries ago mm -hmm. uh, as a way of concentrating the Portuguese merchants and the Portuguese explorers in one re and missionaries, especially in one region so that they could be watched. And as uh, basically thanking the Portuguese uh, king at the time for helping China deal with some pirates in the coast because our, uh, the Portuguese fleet dealt with pirates. So Portugal has always kept this kind of respect and there weren't any official wars between Portugal and China. I think China is not going to be that aggressive, but economically speaking, for sure, mm -hmm. it already is. It already is. Mm -hmm. But uh, the bottom line is we are seeing a different pictures in terms of international relations. China is looking peaceful, as you mentioned, uh, but uh, it treats uh, citizens differently. I mean, I want to go to the Xinjiang province. Mm -hmm. uh, re-education camps you know uh, you, exactly you, you, that's yeah please please go on. The, that that's true and the, the 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 fact of the matter is when china joined the world trade organization back in 2001 the world trade organization the wto i think there was this belief that the system in china would slowly change so the west for a while uh, sorry for using the part of my French, but put up with this kind of attitudes in China, what, what, what was going on internally in China. Because the country was red and rich, so eventually they will become a democracy. That was the thought by many Westerns, by many people in the West, by many Western leaders in the early 2000s. It hasn't happened, and the situation actually moved in the completely opposite way. Mm -hmm. And uh, after Xi Jinping became the, the, the president, and a very important moment, two very important moments, were when Xi Jinping basically became part of the Chinese constitution, because the Chinese constitution mentioned Maoism, the socialism with Chinese characteristics, so Deng Xiaoping, mm -hmm. and now Xi Jinping thought. Mm -hmm. So the Xi Jinping thought. And... Um, for instance, in my, one of the universities where I worked, 
was uh, was full of books basically all of the book uh, books books that were com a compilation of all of the speeches important speeches of xi jinping and the students were required to buy them oh, and yeah. to carry them around they have to study and learn everything about i'm not sure if they had to study or learn it depends on the university but uh, they're required to have those books at least to pretend that they know mm -hmm. because you always have the official version and what really needs to happen so they say you have to know everything but no, nobody's going to check whether you know or not. Okay. But for example, they were, I know for a fact that there are universities where the teachers were asked to translate pro bono without any kind of payment, the book from English to Portuguese, the Xi Jinping thoughts from English to Portuguese. And if the teachers said, well, I don't have time to do that, naturally, they would ask the students. So imagine you're trying to teach Portuguese and your whole class has to translate that. Mm -hmm. So you'd still have this kind of uh, problematics in, in this kind of problems going on in China. But as for the, the, I think that kind of patience from the West is finally over. Because for, ever since Xi Jinping also ended the, the mandate limit, because he's basically president for life, if he wants to, mm -hmm. because before there was a semblance of democracy as in, every president in China is not, I mean, universally elected. You are elected, well, elected by the Politburo, but you have a limit of two mandates. Mm -hmm. Now the limit is over. It's officially done. There is no limit. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, this is very shocking, I think, for the West. Mm -hmm. And at this time, people, the, our governments are paying more attention to what is going on in China. You have the Xinjiang, the Xinjiang situation. The whole Tibetan situation, for example, was something that shocked a lot of people, but the governments all over the world didn't do much, especially after a while. Because there was this kind of, um, how can I explain this? Um, it basically lost value, political value, the situation in Tibet. But the situation in Xinjiang, it's quite hot right now. Mm -hmm. The situation in Hong Kong is hot right now. Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, there is this kind of international pressure that is being applied to China and they are finally opening these wounds in Chinese society. And not very successfully, but they are trying to explore them. And we see this in the lowering popularity of China in Australia, in Canada, in the EU. I saw an Australian, uh, China was large, it was viewed as largely positively, mm -hmm. largely positively by Australian citizens. And nowadays it's not. Ever since the Hong Kong situation happened, ever since you had Chinese, the Chinese government and government institutions using Chinese students in Australia to protest against the Hong Kong situation. I mean, to, to, to do pro-China protests in the streets in Australia. This was shocking for the Australian society. The way the Chinese, basic, the Chinese government basically used our institutions, our democratic institutions, to uh, as a non as a non democratic actor, mm -hmm. basically to to influence society. We have two but, different, actually, as for the Xinjiang province, we have two different narratives. One mm -hmm. is Chinese version of narrative that. Okay, I was talking with my Chinese friend and I was asking about what's going on in Xinjiang mm -hmm. and their claim, their uh, position is like a, a Xinjiang is underdeveloped region and yes. education was not a, enough for them to become a, let's say, civilized 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 a chinese yeah. citizen and that's why government set up a re-education camps again mm -hmm. re-education camps but the different we have in western version of narrative that directly accuses chinese government to violence of international humanitarian law which one is true <laughs> the answer is somewhere in between the thing is in China, you don't have free media. This is very important. First of all, you don't have free media. Secondly, you have a us versus them kind of attitude by the, that was basically, that is basically prevalent in Chinese society. So if the Western people are saying, okay, there is abuse, 
even though there is abuse, or they might believe there is abuse, they're going to claim that there isn't. It's the us versus them. As in, you are foreigners criticizing our country, and it's not what is going on there. I refuse to believe that that's going on. That is very real. And at the same time, the Chinese media doesn't really claim that there is any kind of human rights abuse going on there. That's the first thing. Secondly, you had terrorism in Europe. You had terrorism going on, the Bataclan attacks that was in China when it happened in Paris, mm -hmm. the, the Paris terrorist attacks. And it was shocking in Chinese society at that time because China has a lot of Muslims living there, largely peaceful, but there were also terrorist attacks in China. There was a terrorist attack, I think it was in Kunming train station, mm -hmm. which you had uh, Uyghur, I think they were Uyghur, so Muslims stabbing people in the, the, the train station. Are they related that, to Al-Qaeda or something? Just, I'm curious about that. No, as far as I know, as far as I know, though, they are not related to Al-Qaeda. But, uh, I mean, that group could have been, but I'm, I'm not yeah. that uh, well-versed in what the group. Um, but basically, they're fighting for independence. Mm -hmm. To create some a country that they would call, if I'm not mistaken, East Turkestan. Okay. So, that would be Xinjiang as a country. And China basically securitized these terrorist attacks that were happening abroad and reinforced control, reinforced security checks in subways in Beijing. I was in Beijing at the time. Oh, I wasn't in Beijing, but I've been to, I went to Beijing at the time. And increasing the number of policemen, police stations, armed people patrolling the streets in Xinjiang province. Mm -hmm. Even though the situation, it can't be said that it was largely peaceful at the time because there was some semblance of anti-government forces rising in, in Xinjiang, mm -hmm. but the Chinese crushed them in a really effective way. And what happened was that this is their measure right now, re-education. And for the Chinese people, this is quite popular because they're basically just teaching them not, I'm sorry for the expression, but they are trying to teach them not to be so Muslim. They are teaching them that their religion is not something that they should value, that it's silly superstition, that we are all Chinese. So if you follow that kind of lines, if you follow that kind of propaganda, even though you are a Uyghur, you're not going to have a lot of problems in society. Mm -hmm. But for example, the kind of beard that you have right now, if you are a Chinese citizen in Xinjiang, the police would stop you. Mm. It has happened before. I shouldn't go there like this. You shouldn't go there, <laughs> probably okay. not. Probably not. Right. And um, I had a, a friend who's friends with a Brazilian journalist that went to Xinjiang. He was a Brazilian, he was a, they were a couple of Brazilian journalists. They were a couple together. They were living in China, working in China as journalists. And they traveled to Xinjiang basically on holidays. They were not going to do any cow, any peace on Xinjiang. So they arrived at Xinjiang province. They checked in in a hotel. Everything was going on. Everything was, was okay. They left the hotel. They went outside just to trick, take pictures, check a few monuments. When they came back to the hotel, they noticed that someone had opened the door, entered their bedroom. Their computers would open. They didn't steal the computers, but they basically... Uh, maybe copy the data on the computers. They basically open and search the computers for anything that could be hurtful against China mm -hmm. to know whether they were writing any piece about Xinjiang or not. Mm -hmm. They complained to the office in uh, in the hotel and basically they were dismissed as like, yeah, there's nothing we can do. Nothing bad happened. It wasn't a burglar. Mm -hmm. We weren't robbed. So it, there's a lot of control in that province. Mm -hmm. And now the West is paying attention, I think. But as for the re-education camps, you have to know that our concepts of freedom and liberty, for us, they are two different words. Freedom is one thing. Liberty is a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. But in China, they have the word zio. It means exactly the same thing. So freedom and democracy. There is no difference between one word and the other in Chinese. What does this mean? It means that freedom is not personal freedom in China. It's this kind of liberty, for example. If I say Turkey is a free country, it can mean that Turkey is a country in which you have freedom of speech, but it can also mean you are, you are a sovereign country, an independent country. You are free. Mm -hmm. And I say we are all free in China. 
It means that you don't have any government, any foreign government taking control. The group is free, but as for individual freedoms, they do not matter as much because the group is free and you are part of the group. They say, they say that if you are not part, if you are not a slave to your group, you're going to eventually become a slave to another one, a foreign group. So this means that robbing someone of their personal freedom, freedoms, so forcing someone to go into a re-education camp, even though there isn't any reason sometimes for them to be there, as long as it's for the greater good, people are going to accept it in China. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think that's a big problem. Okay, thank you, uh, Sergio. I think it's it, fine. Uh, it was really great uh, conversation with you. We learned a lot from you, and thank you so much okay. for again. I'm glad. I'm glad I could have this conversation. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you. And um, good luck for the channel. Thank you. Thank you.